okay so um, yeah i think dr rita rochlani has said usg pelvis and that's a great answer so we will um, proceed with ultrasound of the hip joint and um, as we can see that you can see this well defined collection within the joint space you can see thickening of the synovium there and you can see a lot of ecogenic debris within the joint space so that is suggestive of a collection and this was a case of septic arthritis so you have diagnosed septic arthritis by just doing x ray and ultrasound so uh, for again ultrasound is a great modality for joints it is cheap it is easily available there's no preparation required and again it is extremely sensitive for de detecting septic arthritis as well as in inflammatory arthritis where you can see the synovial thickening and aseptic joint effusions okay now moving on so those were all the pros and uh, the mainly pros of ultrasound which is one of the best imaging modality for uh, children and we must not hesitate to use it because there is no radiation involved moving on next to cross sectional imaging which comprises of a ct scan mri uh, pet ct pet mr which again as i mentioned is the purview of nuclear medicine um now typically in cross sectional imaging you do need some form of sedation especially in children less than 6 years or even in older children who may be special children with diff different levels of understanding disabilities etc and children who don't cooperate some children even above the age of 6 are extremely anxious then um if you think that we will be needing to use contrast like in ct or mri we must do a serum creatinine so here is where i would like to again request clinicians that when the child is being subjected for a blood test and you think he will need imaging which needs creat just if it can be added so that the child doesn't need to get another prick and of course cannot emphasize enough on comparison with previous scans so children they must be taught the importance of holding on to their scans and holding on to their medical data for a few years before discarding Okay, now this is the sedation guideline for imaging that we follow at SRCC. It is called the six four two regimen. So we need a six hours complete fasting for all solid food and formula milk, four hours fasting for breast milk and other liquids, and two hours for and and the child can continue to drink clear fluids like water and juice without pulp like appy, fruity, sugar, water, glucose, water, etc. Up to two hours. so there is no need to make the child hypoglycemic to the point where the children and the parents are screaming so this is a very robust regimen that we follow here and it has been very well accepted by uh, the doctors the patients and everyone in so the first imaging which is ct scan computer tomography okay it is no longer a cat scan so let's discard this term completely uh just to explain to you all the difference cat scan was computed axial tomography because back in the day we could only acquire axial images but today with the latest generation of scanners we can and sagittal images as well so it is no longer called a cat scan then um another concept that we must understand is what is this multi slice ct where we say or oh, this center has a four slice eight slice 16 slice ct so these slices are equivalent to the number of detectors in the machine sort of akin to when you when we use the mobile cameras and the pixels in the camera so the number of detectors the faster is the image acquisition so that is uh, very helpful for angiographies etc where you really need the machine to move fast to be able to acquire good quality images now one of the biggest disadvantages of ct scan is that we are administering a relatively high dose of radiation so it really needs to be carefully selected in children but the advan one of the advantages is that it has a very wide field of view but however the more images you acquire and the more area you are going to subject to radiation so again image gently let's only image the area of interest and what is the information that we need to know it is best for structures that contain calcium and bones such as bones the cortex air like what is seen in lung parenchyma bowel and sinuses and it is excellent for contrast enhanced angiography because you are very rapidly acquiring the images of moving blood so you have great um, 
a resolution now we then from ct to hrct and what is the difference so hrct stands for high resolution ct and in the latest generation of scanners that is anything above a 4 or a 16 slice scanner we are always able to acquire hrct images even if you write ct on your prescription and how does that happen this happens because once the scan has been acquired you have acquired the raw data your latest generation of scanners are always able to reconstruct the images in an hrct format so this hrct is a ct where we produce the images which have just 1 mm slice thickness with no gap in between so you are able to assess the minutest of pathologies from the smallest lung nodule to interstitial lung disease so in today's uh, 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 clinical practice we mainly use hrct for imaging the chest which is the lung parenchyma bone the sinuses and the temporal bone now the one of the biggest clinical conundrums that we always face is that should we advise ct scan chest with contrast or an hrct and i will uh, show you in my next slide what are the indications of using contrast but for example when you are suspecting infection you can just ask for a ct scan chest with contrast and in our center we perform it like a single scan with contrast at the same time where you are able to reconstruct it retrospectively in the hrct format and hence you get very comprehensive information which includes lung parenchyma mediastinal structures the lower neck upper abdomen for no extra radiation but really the risk of the minimal risk of giving contrast which as i said now really does not even exist so this is an hrct chest where you can see that there is very high resolution of the interstitium the airways the vessels and as you can see this child has an interstitial lung disease this is the high resolution ct scan of the pns where again you are able to see the mucosal thickening you are able to see all the bony markings you are able to see very well delineate the infundibulum the hiatus semilunaris of the osteomyelial complex okay so just a quick overview on the ct scan and when do we need contrast so if a child comes with trauma or a fall definitely no contrast is usually needed to assess hydrocephalus which is just dilatation of the ventricles in chest when you are looking for an interstitial lung disease lung parenchymal metastasis or if you want to look at the airway for dysplasias or foreign bodies if you want to look at the extremities for fracture or infection so these typically do not need a contrast enhanced scan but you do need a contrast enhanced scan of course as i mentioned in all forms of ct and in chest ct when you are infection when you are suspecting a nodal pathology of infection so you are suspecting enlarged neck nodes mediastinal nodes or abdominal nodes we need to give contrast to see if there is any necrosis within these nodes to delineate the nodes well again in empyema abdomen typically always when we are doing for bowel screening or appendicitis or any other inflammatory or infective pathology of the bowel as well as tumors masses anywhere within the solid organs we nearly always need contrast to do a good structural scan moving on to the next modality of uh, cross sectional imaging which is mri which stands for magnetic resonance imaging so the way we used slices for ct we use tesla for mri which is the magnetic field strength so we say 1.5 tesla or 3 tesla and higher the strength of the magnet better is the signal to noise ratio so better is the resolution so for pediatric patients uh, undergoing scans on a 3 tesla is always very nice because there's very good resolution of the small parts intravenous sedation is almost always required in children under 4 or 5 years as the scan time is longer we as adults find it difficult to stay still in an mri machine so for children it becomes extremely difficult so we have we need a good anesthetist backup a good anesthetist setup to keep them sedated for that long without any adverse complications 
the only i would say absolute contraindication to undergoing an mri is a cochlear implant the new generation of pacemakers have also become compatible with mri but a point to note here is that if a patient with pacemakers going to undergo an mri it is uh, almost always necessary to have the person from the uh, company that has inserted the pacemaker to set the settings so that they don't have issues after the mri is over again for metallic orthopedic implants is always a question when can the person undergo an mri and a lot of literature and studies have shown that any time beyond 6 weeks after the implant it is almost always safe and of course after 3 months it's definitely safe to undergo mri now in mri as we all know we are using gadolinium based contrast agents and these are typically excreted from the kidney so a gfr of less than 30 mg per dl is also uh, an absolute contraindication to using this form of contrast now what are the um, uh, amazing features of mri it has superior soft tissue resolution uh, which uh, as you all know you all must have seen mri images you get beautiful images of the brain spine the chest wall the solid organs you can almost see the organ for what it must be looking like in the patient theater when it is cut open uh you can do another major advantage is that you can do a time of flight angiography and mri without contrast so when you have a patient who has a renal compromise you don't necessarily need uh you don't need to give a a, a contrast if uh, you know there's going to be obviously an issue with the kidney function there is no radiation so again very nice very uh, you know nice imaging modality for children and for pregnant women also as i will show you all later and again it has a wide field of view so you can image a large area in one go so now in mri when do we need contrast and when do we not need contrast so when you are suspecting a structural abnormality of the brain like a focal cortical dysplasia or disorder of neuronal migration uh for css spaces like for hyperlis for and then some of the latest imaging uh, techniques like spectroscopy diffusion tensor imaging some none of these modalities need contrast enhancement but when you are suspecting infection or when we see infection on an mri demyelinating lesions leukodys some of the leukodystrophies pituitary imaging almost always needs contrast when you want to look for pituitary nodules all types of tumors then when you want to do a perfusion study and of course when you want to do a contrast angiography or venography so the, these are this is just a quick overview of the differences between ct and mri do an angiogram and venogram so in a ct study contrast is always needed in mri you can do it without contrast if you do a tof or you can give contrast if if there's no contraindication so now moving on to the newer techniques and modalities are these just new fancy things that are available in the market and they have no use or do we actually have clinical implications so i will just take you through this in a case based format so here is a 9 year old boy who complains of left facial clonic seizure for a year so we proceed with the mri brain where we can see a very well defined focal lesion it is mainly solid but it has a small and it has a small very small part of it which is showing restricted diffusion and when you give contrast you can see that there is avid post contrast enhancement so you know this is a tumor now what are the latest fancy techniques that we can now use to characterize this further so this is what we call as mri brain perfusion where we are doing a perfusion scan of this tumor to know whether it is a low grade or a high grade tumor and if you look at the box table on the a uh, left hand side at the bottom we measure all these different uh, parameters within the tumor and here you can see that the blood flow as you can see the blue graph and the orange graph the orange graph which is in an area of normal tissue and the blue graph which is in an area which is in the abnormal tissue so here you can see the contrast dynamics where there is not a very rapid inflow of contrast in the beginning and there is a sustained and slow uh, up going of the graph which suggests that this is a very low grade which is a relatively low grade tumor the cerebral blood flow the cerebral blood volume everything is on the lower end so this is what we call as mri brain perfusion now next is this technique which is called as mri spectroscopy where we are measuring different metabolites in the brain so now we have done an mri spectroscopy on this tumor where you can see 
that the normal NA is suppressed and there is a high choline peak. And later you can also see that there is lipid lactate peak. So this is what we call as an MRI spectroscopy, which helps to determine the concentration of various metabolites in different parts of the cerebral tissue, which gives us supplementary information in characterizing this pathology further. And just to again repeat that you don't need contrast for spectroscopy, so it can be run in the same uh, test. For tumors, it helps us di uh, differentiate glial from non-glial. It helps in infection, white matter diseases, mitochondrial disorders like Lay syndrome, etc. So it has a good amount of clinical applications. Now, <clears throat> This is the next case of a four-year-old girl who's a known case of aqueductal stenosis. She underwent a third ventriculostomy, but she is still complaining of persistent headache and intermittent vomiting. And here you, we can see that both are still dated. You can see that there is some amount of periventricular seepage of the CSF, which we call periventricular ooze. And as you scan down, you can see that the fourth ventricle is relatively collapsed. So what what can we do next to assess whether this third ventriculostomy is working well or not? Anybody has any suggestions? Okay, so we do this test called the CSF flow metry. So here we are studying real time the dynamics of the CSF flow. And as you can all see, that majority of the CSF is flowing in the anterior premedullary and the supracellar cisternal space. And there isn't very good flow through the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle. So we may want to reconsider going in and taking care of this. So the MRI CSF study is a non-invasive technique. Again, it is non-invasive, does not need contrast. It helps us to study in real time the dynamics of CSF flow. And clinical applications in children is to diagnose aqueductal stenosis. You can look for the patency of a third ventriculostomy. You can also follow the flow at the cervicomedullary junction, like in Kayari 1 malformation, achondroplasia, etc. Now, this is the next case of another imaging technique that we have. So, this is an eight year old child who presented with pain in the shoulder and the right hip. Now, these are two completely non-contiguous uh, uh, joints. So how do we image them both at one go? So we've imaged the shoulder over here by just doing one stir coronal image. And you can see that there is abnormal marrow signal within the metaphysis of the humerus. Then we go down to the hip and you can see that there is abnormal signal in the acetabulum. So this makes us think of some pathology. Does anybody know the answer? I can give you four clues. Option one, vitamin D deficiency. Option two, leukemia. Option three, chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis. And option four, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Would anybody like to take a guess? Okay, so this is an entity called chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis, where you see multiple focal areas of this type of marrow signal abnormality, which is basically an osteomyelitis that is not caused by infection. It is actually an auto-inflammatory process. And this is another technique called whole body MRI that we do at our institution, where we quickly and rapidly assess all the different joints of the body by just doing one imaging modality that is the stir so it can rapidly screen the entire body minus the radiation which is entered with pet ct and these are all the different applications this is our next case of a seven-year-old child with thalassemia and he is posted to undergo bone marrow transplant so can anyone uh, uh, tell me what this imaging modality is i can give you three options one, is this an MR elastography? Two, is this an MRI ion study? Or three, is this ultrasound elastography? Anybody, any guesses? 
Okay, so this, yes, thank you, Dr. Rita. This is an MRI ion study where you can see that we have, we measure the amount of iron in the myocardium and the liver. We also measure iron deposition in the pancreas and the pituitary. And on the basis of this, we get the measurement of iron loading. So this is another technique called MRI iron study or T2-star imaging. And on the basis of the amount of iron loading in different organs. So here you can see that the, in the heart, there is not much deposition. Whereas in the liver and the pancreas, there is a significant amount of iron deposition. And this helps uh, the clinician to uh, administer drugs during and after the process of the bone marrow transplant and also to monitor the amount of iron deposited. Now, this is the next um, uh, imaging technique that we often use. This is a 13-year-old boy who's a known case of hereditary cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And <clears throat> this is uh, what, what imaging investigation is this. Again, I'll give you three options. Is this a cardiac CT? Is this 2D echo or is this cardiac MRI? Anybody? Okay, so this is a cardiac MRI, which is again done here. You can see real time and it's another very robust imaging modality because you don't, you may often get away without doing contrast and you get real time imaging of cardiac qualitative and quantitative functioning akin to the 2D echo with a lot of additional information that can be. So here you can see the hypertrophic muscle of the um, left ventricle, which is really limiting the left ventricular outflow and inflow. And this is the post-contrast imaging, which is showing um, contrast enhancement along the myocardium, which is suggestive of fibrosis. So this is cardiac MRI, which also has many and varied uses. It has wonderful soft tissue details for tumors of the heart like a rhabdomyoma, etc. It is excellent for scarring and viability assessment as in this case where you can see that there is scarring in the myocardium and that alters clinical management for pericardial diseases and functional imaging of congenital heart disease. Now this is the next case of a nine-year-old child who presents with a painful limp an X-ray pelvis shows a small-sized right femoral epiphysis. Anybody for, uh, with the diagnosis, I can give you three options. Is this septic arthritis? Is this inflammatory autoimmune arthritis? Is this Perthes disease? Or is this an epiphyseal dysplasia? Anybody would like to take a guess? Okay, so this is Perthes disease. As we all know, you can see there's altered signal in the femoral epiphysis. There is a small sized epiphysis and you can see that there is a stark signal, difference in signal intensity between the two epiphysis. This is also well uh, appreciated on the sagittal images. This is the affected right side and this, this is the normal left side. And this is the next fancy imaging technique that we have, which is called as a perfusion MRI. So what we do here is that we measure the perfusion, which is the blood flow within this damaged epiphysis. How good is the blood flow so that we know which phase is disease? Is this in the revascularization phase? Is this in the inflammatory phase? Or is this in the fragmentation and sclerosis phase where we can't do anything? So if we catch this disease early on the basis of the perfusion, the orthopedician can actually go and do a core and, and treat this patient. And this is another similar patient with Perthes disease, which we caught early with a perfusion scan. And what you also see very often in these patients, as you can see, we have put different regions of interest across the epiphyseal head. And you are some, we have sometimes seen that there is differential perfusion, the medial aspect between the medial, the central, and the lateral aspect of the femoral epiphysis, there is different perfusion. So once you do that, you can localize where you want to do the core and the uh, drug injections. 
So this is also a very nice imaging quality, which is all right. Now, this is our next case of a 6.5-year-old boy who complains of seizures since day four of life. He gets daily six to eight seizures in a day. There's normal birth and developmental history. So we've done an MRI brain where we see this focal lesion along the precentral sulcus. And this is a typical focal cortical dysplasia. But for the surgeon who needs to go in and operate, this is a very important area of sensory and motor functioning. So this is the next imaging modality that we use in such cases, which is called, called diffusion tensor imaging and fiber tractography, where on the basis of the, uh, of the imaging, we are able to track the fibers, the, all the different tracts, like the corticospinal tract, the projection fibers and the association fibers, which helps us delineate exactly where these fibers are going. This lesion has displaced the sensory and motor fibers around it. So the surgeon goes in and takes the lesion out. And post-operatively, we can again follow up and see that none of these fibers have been damaged. And this was also evident clinically where the child had normal motor functioning. So the diffusion tensor imaging and fiber tractography is for assessment of the white matter tracts by different pathologies like focal cortical dysplasia, gliosis, cystic encephalomalacia, etc. Especially before surgery for surgical planning. So you know where these tracts are, you know what you can cut and what you can't cut. Now this is the next imaging modality. This is a three-year-old patient who had chickenpox and three months later he presented with a left-sided focal seizure. And there was no persistent neurological defect. So this is the routine MRI that shows restricted diffusion in the basal ganglia on the right side as well as in the white matter. And this is what we call a stroke or an ischemic infarct. You can see that there's also abnormality in the signal in the T2-weighted images. So we proceed with a TOF angiogram. And here you can see a very well-defined like defect in the proximal middle cerebral artery. So anybody with what we can do next? What can we do next? I'll give you three clues. Should we go ahead with a contrast angiogram? Should we go ahead with a DSA? Yeah, DSA is a very good option, but as we all know, that DSA is uh, invasive. So we have something called as vessel wall imaging, which is a high resolution imaging of the vessel walls. And here you can see that there is focal contrast enhancement in that region of the vessel. And this is something called as focal cerebral arteriopathy. So this is something that we can use for arteriopathies and vasculitis. This is our next example of the same case. Of another case. Well-developed stroke. When you do the angiogram, you can see that we cannot see the ICA on the left side. And when you do the vessel wall imaging, you can very nicely see the dissection within the vessel. If you can see my arrow, it is you can see the, the wall has been dissected. So this is another very nice, robust imaging modality for pathologies like dissection, vasculitis, and arteriopathy. Now, this is a 32-year-old primary gravida who presented for an 18-week anomaly scan. And I'll just... Ultrasound detected a borderline colpocephaly with suspicious partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. So a fetal MRI was suggested, and here you can see that in addition to the partial agenesis of the corpus callosum, there is a focal cortical dysplasia in the left frontal lobe, and the patient chose to terminate the pregnancy. So fetal MRI is again something that goes. Uh, you know, this is in the uh, prenatal period. And, you know, I know a lot of pediatricians today a lot of, uh, get, get um, referred patients 
from uh, uh, obstetricians who come with uh, an antenatal diagnosis of a, a structural or this thing defect in the fetus and we always the question always is what should we do next so fetal mri is another non invasive modality for imaging the fetus and what has been a landmark change is that there has been an extension of the mpp act before the mpp act was only valid for performing a medical termination before 20 weeks but now this has been extended to 24 weeks and that gives us little bit more time to image a structural defect further and so the patient can actually take a very informed decision on what they would like to do with their pregnancy and should definitely be offered to patients when multiple soft markers are detected on ultrasound or you have found a congenital CNS, spine, chest, or abdominal abnormality and for characterizing that further. Now, this is the next imaging technique, which is a functional MRI, where we localize a cerebral function by seeing the area of cortical activity. So if anybody can see this image and tell me what part have we localized over here, what do you think we activated over here? I'll give you four options motor cortex, visual cortex, sensory cortex, or speech? Yes, I think Dr. Jagruti has given the right answer. Yeah, so we have uh, activated the visual cortex. So again, this is a good imaging modality for um, the function, the you know, the cortical, the, the cerebral function, which is again very important in some cases when you have tumors, gliosis, etc before surgical resection to know to prepare the patient as to what part we are cutting and what activity will be there or not there post-surgery. And the last elastography, which has been another, uh, you know, one of the latest developments to assess fibrosis in patients by assessing the liver stiffness. So we can detect, you know, very early the development of fibrosis and diffuse liver disease, quantify it and monitor it when you, if you are giving therapy. And the main advantage of an ultras MRI, ultrasound, MRI elastography over ultrasound elastography that you can sample a large portion of the liver, which reduces the sampling bias. So, you know, when you can intervene in diffuse liver disease, you can monitor it and you know when the child goes into cirrhosis or not. Thank you. And if there are any questions, I can uh, answer them now. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shonan. That was uh, very comprehensive, but you presented it in very well manner so that everybody can understand. And uh, uh, we have got five minutes we can discuss and if anyone wants to know about something that you could not understand the good thing about uh, our department is that we have every modality possible is available in and uh, uh, we have got other specialities also within under one roof so that if the child comes with some problem that can be cured easily uh, within the same time so uh, any more questions related to radiology, uh, Dr. Sonal and I will be uh, happy to solve your query. I think they have understood everything. Yeah. And... Uh, So with that, uh, yeah, okay, a few so final uh, yeah. final words from you, Dr. Sonal. No, no, thank you, everyone. And uh, just as I said, you know, let's be a little bit mindful about what we are looking for in the child so that we don't unnecessarily radiate and uh, prepare them well before the test. Good clinical radiologic discussions as we have in our center. So thank you so much. And I thank all our clinicians for sending us such nice work. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. So uh, that after our first session, I would like to invite Dr. Margi Desai, who is our second uh, speaker for the day. Dr. Margi Desai is a consultant clinical neurophysiologist. 
and uh, she has a vast experience of 22 years in this field she has pursued md in pediatrics followed by fellowship in uh, clinical neurophysiology from london uk her areas of interest are electrodiagnostic tests which localizes lesions of the central and peripheral nervous system neuromuscular junctions muscle optic nerves retina and brain stem and she has got vast, vast experience in dealing with pediatric condition as well so uh, i would like to invite uh, dr margi desai to speak on emg uh, basics and which can be pertaining to the pediatric age group yeah dr margi desai you can share your screen good afternoon everyone can you all hear me yes we can hear we can see your side thank you good afternoon friends and colleagues um, so let me start here by saying that uh, we have an excellent clinical neurophysiology department at the srcc hospital and incidentally we are neighbors to the mri department um, what i'm going to talk about is the role of emg and nerve conduction in children and the applications for pediatricians so uh, this is a picture of our emg nerve conduction machine at srcc we have a state of the art nicole emg nerve conduction machine it also does evo potentials like vera ssep visual evo potential and brain stem auditory evo potential now let's look at the key electro diagnostic tests which can be done uh, you all have heard of nerve conduction study and emg they go hand in hand so often it's referred to as electro neuromyography enmg another special test that we perform is repetitive nerve stimulation which is used for children with myasthenia it's also called as a decrement study by some sympathetic skin response is a special test for small fiber function and ssep is one of the evoked potentials i'll be talking about it later so what are the i just need to adjust my screen okay the top uh, indications for nerve conduction and emg are sensory complaints whenever a child has numbness or paresthesia in the hands or in the feet it's an indication to do nerve conduction study if this numbness that is the sensory loss is confined to one arm or a hand or a leg that's also an indication for nerve conduction study and of course burning feet and pain pain which can be localized or radiating pain such as sciatica motor complaints now you all know the most common motor complaint is a floppy baby emg and nerve conduction helps in the diagnosis of the etiology of floppy baby i'll discuss that as we go along children can also have acute onset weakness of the lower limbs and upper limbs so when you suspect guillain barre syndrome the first test you should do is nerve conduction study even before the mri test acute onset foot drop and wrist drop are also indications for nerve conduction and emg similarly weakness of the frills bell's palsy and weakness or imbalance while walking is an indication for nerve conduction and ssep test so what are the common nerve conduction studies that we perform the nerve conduction study always begins with sensory nerve conduction this can be performed in median ulnar and radial nerves after the sensory conduction we go on and do the motor nerve conduction so in the upper limb motor conduction can be done in the median ulnar radial and axillary nerve and in some certain special cases like brachial plexus palsy we can also do it for the musculocutaneous nerve in the lower limbs motor conduction can be done in tibial and peroneal nerves and sensory conduction can be performed on superficial peroneal and sural nerves now in all the nerves where motor conduction is done we also check the f waves so this is useful for proximal conduction in the motor pathway and lastly we perform the h reflex response which is performed in the lower limbs h reflex response tests the s1 nerve root so it's a monosynaptic pathway which checks the s1 nerve root 
for the face we can evaluate the facial nerve conduction and we can also do the blink reflex which gives us an idea about the brain stem function so let's look at the entire neuraxis and which test evaluates what part of the nervous system so as you can see here this is the peripheral sensory nerve and the sensory receptor mm -hmm. this can be evaluated with sensory nerve conduction now this is the motor axon so this motor axon can be evaluated by motor nerve conduction and if you look at the proximal part of the motor nerve which is close to the nerve root and the anterior horn cell which lies within the spinal cord this area is evaluated by the f wave so it checks proximal conduction in the motor nerve repetitive nerve stimulation so now here where the nerve ending attaches itself to the muscle fiber this is the neuromuscular junction this can be evaluated by repetitive nerve stimulation and lastly you have the muscle the muscle can be tested with the help of emg electromyography emg can also let us give us information about diseases of anterior horn cell that is here and diseases of nerve roots so emg gives uh, information on muscle disease anterior horn cell disease and root lesions so let's look at the procedure first the child's skin is clean if it is cold then it is warm because you know that if the skin is cold then there is slowing of conduction velocity so it should at least be more than 34 degrees c after cleaning stick on electrodes are applied so one must reassure the child that it's not a painful application a small stimulus is then given to the skin to the nerve when we do the sensory conduction or the motor conduction now this current is in milliamps the child will feel it but it's not painful so if we feel that a child is going to be very agitated and may not be able to tolerate the test then we sedate the child with melatonin and if it's a very small child then we sedate with pedicloral if it's an older child who understands a little bit we often ask him to play a video game on the phone or listen to music and they are then able to tolerate the test and do it without any sedation after having applied the electrodes and stimulating the skin we then record the response so when we do sensory conduction the response is called sensory response or the snap and in motor conduction the response is known as cmap the proximal pathway responses are the f waves and the h reflex which i showed you in the neuraxis diagram so let's look at the sensory nerve conduction now this is a picture of sensory nerve conduction in the median nerve in the hand and this is the response which we recorded as you can see it's an action potential and it is a summation of the action potential of all the sensory axons within the nerve that's why it's a summated sensory action potential and hence it carries then it goes by the name sensory nerve action potential now as you know sensory nerve action potential can be normal reduced or absent in case there is an abnormality and we can also measure the sensory conduction velocity in this study this sensory conduction velocity can be normal or slow so let's look at the application of sensory nerve conduction this is a 12 year old girl who presented with a four month history of numbness over her feet and soles so it was a sub acute story she could not place her feet on the ground because of pain and severe burning in the soles after the onset of complaint in the feet she also had history of numbness in both hands since one month there was normal strength in both arms and legs she had no difficulty in climbing stairs so that suggests that she didn't have any proximal muscle weakness there was no family history of similar complaints so it suggests that it's not an inherited problem on examination she did not have test cables deep tendon reflex is all were present except for the ankle jerks which were absent so absent ankle jerks always raises the suspicion of a peripheral neuropathy sensory nerve conduction was performed now as you can see here this is superficial peroneal and sural nerve conduction so these are sensory nerves in the lower limbs and as you can see here look at the snap amplitude it is absent 
so there are absent sensory responses from both lower limbs and now let's look at the sensory conduction in the upper limb so if you look here these values are small so there are re reduced amplitude of sensory responses from the upper limb as well so this tells us that there is a sensory neuropathy in the lower limbs more than the upper limb now what was what about the motor nerve conduction it was normal from both lower limbs from the tibial and peroneal nerves and it was also normal from the upper limb so this tells us that motor fibers are not involved and her complaints if you see they were also sensory she had tingling numbness and burning in the soles more than the hands so what is the diagnosis of this child she has a generalized peripheral sensory neuropathy which is axonal in type why axonal because sensory nerve action potentials are absent or reduced and it is a symmetric peripheral neuropathy symmetrically involving both legs and hands and there is no evidence of a motor neuropathy so now nerve conduction doesn't give us any idea about the etiology of a peripheral neuropathy but on history on detailed history taking we came to know that she had been receiving thalidomide for juvenile rheumatoid arthritis for the last 2 years so thereby she had developed a drug induced axonal peripheral sensory neuropathy so history taking is a must before you start nerve conduction and emg because that is the only uh examination which will give you a clue as to what is the etiology of the peripheral neuropathy electro diagnosis per se doesn't tell you about the etiology it only tells you about the pathology some of the common drugs which can cause peripheral neuropathy sensory more than motor are second line anti tuberculous therapy anti retroviral therapy you all know vincristine is one of the chemotherapy drugs which commonly causes peripheral neuropathy even prolonged use of metronidazole and iv methotrexate can lead to peripheral neuropathy in the indian vegetarian population another common cause of a peripheral sensory neuropathy is vitamin b12 deficiency let's look at motor nerve conduction now so this is how we perform motor nerve conduction this is stimulation of median nerve at the wrist and recording from the abductor pollicis brevis which is a thenar muscle and this is stimulation of the tibial nerve at the ankle and recording from the abductor hallucis which is a small muscle of the foot innervated by the tibial nerve so then we record a motor response now what is a motor response this is what you see a compound muscle action potential this is summation of the action potential of all the motor axons within the nerve so we first stimulate at wrist and then proximally at elbow so we get a motor conduction velocity in the segment so the segment between wrist and elbow would be the forearm so therefore you can get a latency which can be normal or prolonged you get a motor response that is a compound muscle action potential which can be normal or small and you get a motor conduction velocity which can be normal or slow so all these three parameters are judged to come to a conclusion whether the child has a motor neuropathy or not after having done the motor conduction with the same stimulator we can record proximal conduction this proximal conduction is known as recording f waves they measure conduction in the proximal segment of the motor nerves and its relevance is that absent f waves are usually the first abnormality in aidp that is in guillain barre syndrome and f waves are prolonged in demyelinating neuropathies so as you can see here this is the motor response and after getting the motor response you record these late responses which are known as f waves so motor nerve conduction helps in differentiating between axonal and demyelinating neuropathy so it helps and it tells us about the pathology of the neuropathy what do we see in demyelinating neuropathy there is marked slowing of motor conduction and there is prolongation of f wave latencies now why does this happen let's look at this diagram you all know that there is saltatory conduction in a myelinated axon so this yellow part is the axon and this is the myelination 
So what happens when you lose this myelin? This myelin sheath is lost, so saltatory conduction is blocked. And therefore, the conduction velocity becomes slow because myelinated exons have greater conduction velocity than unmyelinated nerves with even 100 times more diameter. So this is the velocity in a myelinated fiber and this is the velocity in an unmyelinated fiber. So if a child has a demyelinating disorder, then the velocity becomes slow. Now what happens in an exonal peripheral neuropathy? There is minimal or no slowing of motor conduction velocity because the myelin sheath is intact. But here the exon itself degenerates. So there is reduction in motor response amplitude, which means that the CMAP amplitude, which I showed earlier, becomes small. So there is reduction in CMAP amplitude, but no slowing of motor velocity. So let's look at that. So this is the pathophysiology in an exonal neuropathy. Now this is a normal motor nerve. This each one is an exon. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight motor exons here. We stimulate the nerve. We get a summated action potential. And this is called the CMAP, the compound muscle action potential. Now, out of these exons, six have degenerated because the child had an exonal neuropathy and only two exons are surviving. So only these two exons contribute to the muscle action potential and therefore it becomes So in exonal neuropathy, there is loss of motor exons and therefore reduce CMAP amplitude. So now when you are looking at it, it tells you that there is loss of motor exons in this child. The application. This is a 14-year-old boy who presented with bilateral foot drop for the past six years. So long-standing bilateral foot drop. He also had recent onset of difficulty in climbing stairs. However, he had no paresthesia in hands of it, so no sensory complaints. On examination, he had high arch feet, that means he had pescavus. And on eliciting the deep tendon reflexes, we found that he had generalized areflexia. So what about the sensory nerve conduction? His median and ulnar sensory responses were absent from both upper limbs. So he did not have any sensory complaints, no tingling numbness, but his median and ulnar sensory responses were absent. In the lower limbs also, sural sensory responses were bilaterally absent. Let's look at the motor nerve conduction. So now if you see here, these are the CMAP amplitudes. They look pretty okay. But let's look at the motor conduction velocity. In the right median nerve, the velocity is very slow. It's only 22 meters per second. Normal velocity should be more than 49 meters per second in the upper limb. And now let's compare it with the left upper limb. So if you see here, 22 and 19. So there is symmetric slowing of motor conduction velocity in both upper limbs. And let's look at the F waves. Now normal F wave latencies in children range between 16 to 20 milliseconds. In his case, it is 73 milliseconds on the right and 74 on the left. So again, symmetrically prolonged F waves. So now we discussed earlier that why does F wave get prolonged? F waves get prolonged when you have a demyelinating neuropathy. Why? Because when you have loss of myelin, there is loss of saltatory conduction and there is severe slowing of velocity. So this is the picture I was trying to show you. That when you have a demyelinating neuropathy, there is slowing of velocity and prolongation of F waves. And that is exactly what we found in this child. Symmetrically prolonged F waves. Motor nerve conduction, the tibial and peroneal nerves were electrically inexcitable at the ankle. So when we stimulated these nerves at ankle, there was no motor response. So CMAPs were absent from both peroneal and tibial nerves at the ankle. So now there is no information available from nerve conduction in the low motor conduction in the lower limb because we didn't record a motor response. So our primary information is from nerve conduction in the upper limb. And that showed that there was slowing of both the motor conduction velocity and the F waves. So the diagnosis in our child is symmetric, demyelinating sensory motor polyneuropathy. And because it is symmetric, it is suggestive of an inherited peripheral neuropathy such as hereditary motor sensory neuropathy type 1 which was earlier known as Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. So the interesting feature in inherited neuropathies is 
that these patients do not have sensory complaints. They never complain of tingling, numbness or burning despite absent sensory responses in nerve conduction. That is because this process has been there right from the beginning. If you have an acquired neuropathy, you always have sensory complaints. But in inherited neuropathy, they don't have sensory complaints. Let's look at the role of nerve conduction in the diagnosis of focal neuropathy. So up until now, we discussed generalized neuropathies, which affected both arms and both legs. What about focal neuropathies? So nerve conduction is diagnostic in focal compression neuropathies. For example, if there is radial nerve compression in the axilla or radial nerve compression in the focal, in the spiral group, say because of compression when a child is traveling by bus for prolonged hours and he puts his arm on the window and the radial nerve gets compressed in the spiral groove, then he can have an acute onset of foot wrist drop. Similarly, when the common peroneal nerve is compressed at the fibular head, the child can develop a foot drop. Now, in COVID times, a lot of children were sitting with, your, with their legs on the sofa or chairs and attending school for prolonged periods. And we commonly saw, we saw quite a lot of foot drop during COVID because of common peroneal compression at the fibular head. Now, this can be demonstrated by motor nerve conduction. I also wanted to state that EMG and nerve conduction is more useful in focal compression neuropathies than MRI because you don't see much in an acute onset wrist drop or foot drop on imaging, but a motor nerve conduction will definitely show you a proximal conduction block and that will be diagnostic. Let's look at the role of motor conduction along with F waves in clinical practice. So this is another case. This is a 10-year-old girl who presented with acute onset and progressive weakness in both lower limbs for past seven days. So very acute onset. She was unable to walk only for the past two days. So as you can see, first weakness and then inability to walk. There was no paresthesia in hands or feet. Her grip was slightly weak though. Normal sensations and there was no sphincter dysfunction. Her cranial nerves were spared. And her deep tendon reflexes, there was generalized areflexia. So at this point, what would you clinically think of? Acute onset weakness with no sensory symptoms and normal cranial nerves, normal sphincters. You would probably suspect that this child could be having Guillain-Barre syndrome. So the first test you should ask for is nerve conduction study. And in her case, sensory nerve conduction was normal. Sensory responses were normal from the upper limb and both lower limbs. However, the motor conduction was abnormal. So now if you look at the motor conduction in median nerve, the motor response at wrist was small, as you can see here. But now let's look here. So this is the response at wrist. And look at the response at elbow. Not only is it smaller, but it is wider. So this is known as conduction block with temporal dispersion. And there is slowing of the motor conduction velocity. So these two parameters, conduction block and slowing, are features of acquired demyelinating neuropathy. And what is GPS? It is an acquired demyelinating neuropathy. Now, F waves in median now, they were also prolonged. Normal latency would be 16 to 20 milliseconds. In her case, it was 42 milliseconds, so it was prolonged. In the lower limb, in the tibial now, again, CMAP at the ankle was small and it was spread out like this. So that is known as dispersion of the CMAP. And then if you look upon stimulation at popliteal fossa, it is even smaller. So what was 0.7? became only 0.4 millivolt at popliteal fossa. So dispersed and small CMAP. So this is also known as a partial conduction block. And the motor conduction velocity was slow as well. It was 29 meters per second as opposed to a normal of 40 meters per second. F waves were absent in the tibial now. So I had mentioned earlier that absent F wave is often the first abnormality in Guillain-Barre syndrome. So therefore, the diagnosis in our patient is an acquired demyelinating 
motor polyneuropathy, which means it's, it is known as AIDP, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, clinically known as Guillain-Barre syndrome. So these diagnostic features that we saw in nerve conduction and EMG are usually evident on the by the fourth day or by the end of the first week. So nerve conduction is a diagnostic test of GBS in the first week of the illness. Now, nerve conduction can differentiate between inherited neuropathy and acquired neuropathy. So inherited neuropathy is HMSN. I showed you that there is symmetric slowing of nerve conduction and acquired neuropathy is Guillain-Barre syndrome, the case that we just discussed. And EMG and nerve conduction help dis distinguish between these two types of neuropathies. Now, what is the difference between electrophysiology and imaging? Nerve conduction and EMG assess function of the neuroaxis, whereas Imaging usually shows structure. So often in patients who have wrist drop, foot drop, carpal tunnel syndrome, if the structure is intact, the MRI may not show significant abnormality, but nerve conduction definitely will. Now, what about EMG? Now in EMG, we usually sedate the child and a concentric needle is inserted in the skeletal muscle, it goes in inside only about a centimeter deep. When the child contracts the muscle, motor unit potentials are recruited and we see them on the screen of the EMG machine. When we see these motor unit potentials, we analyze their morphology and we also listen to the sound. And then looking at all that, we decide whether the motor unit potentials are normal or abnormal. So let me show you an example. So the child is contracting and you are seeing these units. These are known as motor unit potentials. They are seen on the screen of the machine when the child contracts the machine. So as if I drag this further, you can see the child is contracting and you see more and more units. Now all these motor unit potentials look normal because they have normal morphology and normal amplitude. So by looking at the EMG, I can say that this muscle is normal. It is not innervated. So the, I showed you a picture of a motor unit. But what is a motor unit? A motor unit comprises of all muscle fibers which are innervated by a single motor exon. So here, I, this picture shows two exons. One is red and one is blue. All the muscle fibers which are innervated by the red exon comprise this motor unit. And all the muscle fibers innervated by the blue exon comprise the second motor unit. And if we look at the screen, the motor unit potential will look like this. So what is the role of EMG in clinical practice? EMG helps in the diagnosis of anterior horn cell disorders in children such as SMA, spinomuscular atrophy, and another anterior horn cell disease, which is polio. Nowadays, we have a lot of viral diseases which mimic and cause acute flaccid paraparesis. EMG will show abnormality also helps in the diagnosis of muscle disease. It cannot be obtained from nerve conduction. This cell can you say whether the muscle is normal or not. You have you can get no idea about myopathy by doing only a nerve conduction. You can get no idea of a radiculopathy if you do only a nerve conduction and do not do EMG. So if only nerve conduction is performed, SMA, myopathy, polio, polioclastic illnesses, and radiculopathies can be missed. Let's look at a case which helps in. I'm just showing you a case which helps you assess or find the etiology of a floppy baby. So let's say you have a neonate or an infant who's floppy and who's come to your clinic. Now, where is the site of lesion? What is the etiology of the floppy baby? The site of lesion can be anywhere along the neuraxis. So let me show you how. The child could have lesion at the anterior horn cell 
if he is suffering from spinomuscular atrophy (SM), that would lead to floppy baby. The child can have a peripheral sensory and motor neuropathy and still be floppy. So that condition is inherited severe demyelinating sensory motor neuropathy (HMSN type 3), also known as Dejerin-Sota syndrome. The lesion can be also at the neuromuscular junction. The child could be having congenital myasthenia and present as a floppy baby. Or the lesion can be at the level of the muscle. The child can have a congenital myopathy or a congenital muscular dystrophy and still be floppy. So a lesion along entire neuraxis can have a similar presentation of floppy baby. And this can be differentiated by EMG in the following manner. EMG will help differentiate between SMA, that is anterior horn cell, and myopathy. So how does it do that? Let's look at this picture. If the child has SMA, the EMG will be neurogenic. So it will show this polyphasic motor unit potential, which is of long duration and large amplitude. So you can see it has many phases. No, it is a complex motor unit and it's known as a polyphasic motor unit. It is very large in amplitude also. So this is known as neurogenic EMG. And you see a neurogenic EMG in SMA and polio. Now, if the motor units are very small in amplitude and short in duration, we call them myopathic EMG. So these two pictures can only be seen with needle EMG. They cannot be elicited on nerve conduction. So a myopathic EMG will tell you that child either has a myopathy muscular dystrophy. So EMG helps distinguish between SMA and myopathy. Repetitive nerve stimulation helps in the diagnosis of congenital myasthenic syndrome. And nerve conduction will show slowing of velocity and help in the diagnosis of a severe demyelinating neuropathy such as HMSN type 3. So let's look at the repetitive nerve stimulation for the diagnosis of congenital myasthenia. So repetitive nerve stimulation, the electrode application is the same as motor nerve conduction. It is a slightly painful test because seven stimuli are given at one after the other at a frequency of 2 hertz. Then, so these are the seven stimuli given. We see the difference in the amplitude between the first response and the fourth response. So you can see here that the first response is so big and the fourth response has reduced considerably. This reduction is known as decrement. Now in this child, the reduction is a 48% decrement. So you can see here how it drops from the first to the fourth. And this is 48% in this case. This is at rest. This is immediately after exercise. So we ask the child to exercise, raise the thumb and exercise for 30 seconds. And then we take the reading again one minute after exercise. So you can see in all three instances, there is a sharp drop in CMAP amplitude between the first and the fourth response. That is known as an abnormal decrement. Normal de drop should only be 10% between the first and the fourth response. But in our case, the drop is anywhere from 42, 38, 50 and 50%. So this is abnormal. An abnormal decrement is suggestive of a post-synaptic defect in the neuromuscular junction and it is compatible with myasthenia gravis. So now we have gone through the entire gamut of causes of a floppy baby. EMG, helps. So SMA can be diagnosed with EMG. HMSN type 3 can be diagnosed with nerve conduction. Myasthenia gravis can be diagnosed with repetitive nerve stimulation. And myopathy can be diagnosed again with EMG. Lastly, I will talk about the role of nerve conduction and EMG in obstetric brachial plexus lesion. So it first of all tells us where is the lesion. Is it in the upper trunk? Then it's known as Urbs palsy or whether it is in the lower trunk. Then EMG tells us that is the lesion just neuropraxia. Neuropraxia means there is just stretching and demyelination in the nerve. 
or exonotomesis. Exonotomesis means there is severe injury to the exon. And this means that the child will have a lot of weakness and the prognosis is poor. EMG will demonstrate whether there is total denervation of the muscle. If the muscle is totally denervated, the child cannot use the muscle. The child will have severe weakness and this suggests a poor prognosis. And it is an indication for some surgical management. EMG will also demonstrate regeneration. So EMG shows re-innervation in the form of polyphasic motor unit potentials. And this indicates that there has been collateral sprouting in the nerve ending. So EMG tells us about denervation, severity of the nerve lesion, and the presence of re-innervation. So what are the limitations of EMG and nerve conduction? Obviously, this test is useful for peripheral nerve con peripheral nervous system. It's not useful for CNS and central disorders. So it's not useful in patients with stroke or Parkinsonian syndrome. Sometimes EMG can be normal in metabolic myopathy, such as osteomalacic myopathy, and it can be normal in steroid myopathies. So EMG will be normal in dystrophies and <clears throat> dystrophies and <clears throat> polymyositis, but it can be normal in steroid myopathy. And the relative contraindication of EMG is that if a patient is on anticoagulants and the INR is greater than 2.5, then I do not perform EMG. If the platelet count is below 20,000, then also I do not do needle EMG. I will just do nerve conduction study. Lastly, let's talk about somatosensory evoke potential. So let's look at one case. This is a 10-month-old girl who had normal motor development, no weakness in the lower limbs. Knee jugs were present, but ankle jugs were absent. And this is what she had, a clump of hair in the back and a dimple at the back. <clears throat> because of this clue, an MRI of the dorsal lumbar spine was done. It demonstrated a tethered cord, diastomatomyelia, and vertebral defects. So she had a meningomyelocele and tibial SSCPs were done. Now, if you look at the tibial SSCP, this is the morphology. It looks like a V-shaped response and this is what we look at the p40 why is it p any wave that goes down is known as a positive wave in normal subjects it arrives at a latency between 30 to 40 so it's called p40 now in case of the right lower limb you can see the p40 latency is normal which i've highlighted in green but you look at the left lower limb ssc here the p40 latency is 40 milliseconds so there is a huge difference between the right and the left leg now, usually the interleg latency difference should not be more than 4 milliseconds. In her case, it is 16 milliseconds and this is abnormally delayed. So what is the interpretation? The child has unilaterally prolonged left tibial SSCP, suggestive of asymmetric posterior column dysfunction. Now, what do we mean by posterior column? Posterior column are the dorsal tracts in the spinal cord, the tracts of Gall and Burdak. So SSCPs provide information on function of the posterior column of the spinal cord. In our case, the child has meningomyelocele, so there is disruption of the posterior columns. And because of that, her left tibial SSCP is prolonged. So SSCPs are often abnormal in children with spinal defects. SSCPs can also be delayed in demyelinating disorders. Why is that? Because demyelinating disorders affect the tracks of the spinal cord. So if a child has multiple sclerosis or an inherited leukodystrophy, then SSCPs can be prolonged. SSCPs can be delayed in children with meningomyelocele and in those with myelopathies. So this is the role of doing SSCPs in children. So to summarize, EMG and nerve conduction are an extension of the clinical examination. History taking is a must before we start our study. One must ask about history of medications, drugs, family history of a similar disorder. What was the duration of the disorder? Is it acute? Is it subacute? Is it chronic? That will give you an idea as to what is the etiopathogenesis behind the problem. Electrodiagnosis localizes the site, that is the level of the lesion. Everything in neurology is about where is the lesion. Is the lesion at anterior horn cell? 
Is it at the level of the root? Is it at the level of the peripheral nerve? Is it at the level of the neuromuscular junction or at the level of the muscle? So this is the entire neural axis starting from the spinal cord to the muscle. And EMG nerve conduction helps localize the site or the level of the lesion. Now, once you localize your lesion, you want to know what is the pathology of the lesion. Is it exonal or is it demyelinating? Now, we know that most demyelinating neuro disorders can be treated. And exonal neuropathies usually carry a poorer prognosis. So, it is important to judge the pathology of the neuropathy and this can be determined from the nerve conduction test. After diagnosing this, we want to know what is the severity of the neuropathy. Is it mild, moderate or severe? And nerve conduction can answer the question. EMG monitors nerve function over time. So nerve conduction will tell you whether the sensory responses and the motor responses have improved after therapy or have they deteriorated as the neuropathy worsens. And EMG will tell you whether there is re in the muscle. If there is re in the muscle, it means that there is collateral sprouting of the nerve terminal and this patient is going to improve. Now, how does re occur? re occurs by physiotherapy. So let's say a patient has denervation in muscles of the lower limb. We ask the patient to do a lot of physiotherapy of the feet and the legs. Exercise tells the nerve and brings about collateral sprouting of the nerve endings. These collateral sprouts will again go and innervate the muscles. And that is how there will be improvement in the CMAP and the SNAP. EMG will show polyphysic motor unit potentials and with re the patient will have improvement in muscle power. EMG and nerve conduction also help in assessing complications of treatment as we saw. Neuropathy is caused due to anti-tubercular therapy, anti-retroviral therapy or chemotherapy can be assessed and evaluated by nerve conduction studies. Thank you for your attention. I can take some questions if you have any. Uh, hi, Dr. Margi Puja here. Hi. Hi, hi. Thank you for this excellent talk. Um, I think today we've all learned about uh, all the conditions and all the uh, times that the child should be referred for a nerve conduction study. And also, I think the wealth of information that one gets from this study. Uh, I would like to tell um, all the attendees here today that uh, a pediatric EMG is very labor intense. It requires a lot of skill and expertise to do and interpret the results. And uh, Dr. Margi is doing an excellent job. So thank you, ma'am, for this talk. Um, and yeah, any questions, please ask uh, directly or in the chat box. Um, any questions? Ma'am, no questions, I think. Uh, yeah. Nothing in the chat box. So, uh, yeah. we, so I think uh, uh, we, can, yeah. we can give the screen to Dr. Priyanka now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, oh, there's a, oh, there is a question. Sorry. Um, when, do you, when do you do a nerve conduction in OBS policy? At, the, at three months, it's a good time to do nerve conduction in a child with OBS policy. Because if the child doesn't have improvement at the end of three months, then uh, you should uh, refer the child to the surgical team. So I would say at the end of three to four months. Yeah, that's a very relevant question because many a times the presentation is very delayed. They will come at one year and two years after therapy and has not shown much improvement and it's kind of a little late to do anything at that point. So, yeah, so, you know, three months uh, is a good time. Mm -hmm. All of us have heard talks from plastic surgeons. So, they say that at, if at the end of four months, the child doesn't have anti-gravity movement. So, the most important function for any child is to flex the arm. 
you know so that they can wear clothes they can eat they, their hand should be able to reach their face so if there is no function of the biceps or the brachioradialis at all at the end of 3 or 4 months then there is an indication for surgical intervention that's why you should do emg and nerve conduction at around 3 to 4 months age and if there is zero power in biceps and brachioradialis they are completely denervated then it is an indication for surgical intervention right ma'am um any any other questions uh ma'am one more question is there any test for monitoring bell's palsy not monitoring but we can prognosticate so usually uh, we do facial nerve conduction and blink reflex and say a uh, patient will do physiotherapy and then we repeat it at the end of 6 weeks and at the end of 12 weeks so that is 3 months if the nerve conduction uh, shows strong abnormalities then we can say that there is poor prognosis and the patient can do some surgical therapy so in order to do that you have to compare facial nerve conduction of the affected side with the normal side and compare the cmap amplitudes and we also see for r1 response in the blink reflex so if the r1 response of the blink reflex hasn't appeared at the end of 3 months and the cmaps from the affected side are very small less than 50% of the normal side then it suggests unfavorable prognosis and we say so in the report and then the plastic surgeon has to take it further from there okay um any anybody has any other questions before we move to the next speaker Okay. Um, I think no. So yeah, I'm going no to sign questions. out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, yes, ma'am. Th thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. hi everyone uh, good afternoon is everybody able to hear me sorry yes ma'am we can yes. hear you yes can hear me right mm -hmm. yeah yes so, yes uh, should i start my talk hello Yeah, yeah sorry ma'am i'll just i'll just do a little brief introduction for you before we start contract contract okay so um, i'm going to very happy to introduce a very dear colleague uh, dr priyanka parekh she is a senior consultant in developmental pediatrics uh, she has worked in both mumbai and the uk uh, in this area of developmental pediatrics and her areas of interest are autism adhd learning disabilities and a host of other neurological conditions uh, which have intellectual disability cerebral palsy and other genetic conditions uh, she is trained for she is trained to administer uh, no she is trained to administer uh, and uh, do the assessment for high risk newborns uh, and also the only person in mumbai to do the griffiths mental developmental scale uh, based in uh, which is sort of from which is in london um, and um, uh, she has um, sorry can everybody my voice is cracking all right so uh, yeah yeah so um yeah so happy to introduce dr priyanka parekh she is going to be talking on a very uh, relevant um, a subject we all of us see in all all our uh, different spec uh, uh, expertise and that is autism awareness it's going to be a case based uh, approach and overview mm -hmm. oh, thank you ma'am um before you start your talk priyanka yes can you can you ask the admin to please mute the participants a lot of people seem to have their mobile phones on that's why we are hearing a lot of disturbance thank you uh, yeah yeah so uh, uh may please mute the participant so is is dr hiren there hiren uh signal uh, uh, yeah. see hiren i think Or has Pooja stepped Lee out yeah i can uh, just uh, yeah yeah i'll just get in touch yeah yeah yeah, yeah. all right so thank you puja for the 
So apparently Rahul Mishra is the co-host. So ask Rahul Mishra to mute everyone else. I don't know where Rahul Mishra is just now. All right. So maybe we can just start and uh, hope that it goes uh, without any interruptions or disturbances. So um, thank you, Pooja, for the warm introduction. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me for this talk in the masterclass today. So what I would be doing is uh, talk about some of the common developmental conditions. So we'll be talking about learning disabilities as well as ADHD. And April is the Autism Awareness Month. Second April is the Autism Awareness Day and the whole month uh, there are various activities and talks done for autism awareness. So I would also be giving a brief overview on autism awareness. So uh, we'll be talking about a child not doing well in school. So all of you in whichever specialty that you may be you know, working in or whichever subspeciality in medicine or pediatrics that you be working in, you would definitely be coming across children uh, or parents even just mentioning offhand that the child is not doing very well in school. Right? We commonly come across these phrases and about 20% of children in a classroom do get poor marks and contribute to a large percentage of the school dropouts that comes to about one in five students who at some point have trouble keeping up with academics, whether it is early school days or even the secondary school or even the college. So this is just a symptom, which is like the tip of an iceberg. And it reflects a much uh, deeper underlying problem, which we all need to look into. So when a child is not doing well in school, what we call as scholastic backwardness, what are the different factors or different causes for scholastic backwardness? So I'm just listing a few of the uh, causes and we would be discussing some of them in greater detail. So we have entities like specific learning disabilities, attention issues, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. There are children who, would, who could be having a below average intelligence or who are slow learners. There could be emotional problems, anxiety, depression, which could be leading to a decline in the academic performance. There could be other behavioral concerns. There could also be sleep concerns, what we call as sleep hygiene. So a child not sleeping well at night due to various reasons, it could also be obstructive reasons or adenoids or other reasons, which could then again affect attention and learning during the school hours. There could be medical concerns, Again, a child could be having chronic medical issues, whether it is cardiovascular or nephrological or neurological, which could either be primarily affecting learning or it could also be leading to prolonged school absenteeism, which again affect the learning and the performance. So again, let's look at some cases. Now we have here an eight-year-old boy who is studying in standard three and he has been referred with concerns of difficulties in school work. So just like any pediatric history taking, we would you know, start right from the beginning. This child is born full term, normal delivery. Everything was fine, cried, was uh, average birth weight and all the postnatal events were quite fine. Uh, going into the developmental history and profile, cross motor wise, all the milestones were achieved on time. Parents did say that the child never liked drawing and on assessing and doing the developmental aspects of the assessment was seen to be having mild fine motor difficulties. Uh, mom did say that the, the, the child spoke a little later than most other children. So the child was not really speaking until two, two and a half and the first words came in after that. He did pick up later, but even now has trouble narrating things, describing things in detail and the to and fro conversations are brief. So he really doesn't you know, talk in details or elaborate on conversations. Socially, he's been doing fine with friends. So this is a child who is not interested in studies, but is good and likes all the other non-academic activities. Looking at the academic profile based on history and also the informal assessment, which is done as a part of the evaluation. So the child has difficulty reading words and sentences. And 
the accuracy of the word reading. So a lot of, uh, you know, aspects where you saw reverses. So the saw was read as was. Uh, the child is slow in writing, is making quite a few spelling errors and you're seeing reverses even in the writing. So B and D. So aspects where you're writing big versus dig. Or, as, or, or even in the reading, the child is reading boy for dog. So you're you know, using, seeing these kind of errors. You're also seeing mistakes in copying the numbers. So when going through the school books and the school work, you can note these errors of you know, copying and even confusing signs. So when there is a plus, you confuse it for multiplication and vice versa. The child has difficulty with the computations. So now in third grade, They've started with the carry forward, addition, subtractions, a borrowing. They've started with basic multiplication, but the, stylist, the child is still struggling with the simple addition and subtraction. So looking at school work and books, we are seeing that you know, there's a lot of incomplete work and the child is also not able to complete the exam papers which have just about started. So here what we are seeing is the child would be having what we call as a specific learning disability. But along with this, when we are looking at the overall development and the profile, we are also seeing that the child has had history of you know, language delays and even fine motor wise, the child is showing mild difficulties with fine motor development. Now, let's look at an older child who is in secondary grade. Now, this child is 13 or 9 month old. He has finished 8th and just started with the 9th standard. Here the concerns are that the child has difficulty in learning and understanding what is going on in the classroom and specifically having difficulty with the math tasks. So what the mom says that just the day prior, I'm you know, taking all his work and he gives me the answers when I'm taking, but when the exam goes, it blank. Ho jata hai. So he's not writing anything in the exam and the boy says that, no, I just went blank. I couldn't remember anything. So this child is also unable to complete the class assignments and everybody is calling the child as lazy. Some of them call the child as troublemaker. So this child has inability to work quickly, starts daydreaming, tends to zone off in on and off. And the parents also reported that, yeah, even since a younger, you know, uh, in the early years, in the primary years, also the child had attention issues, was quite restless, would not sit in one place, and even now the child you know, tends to be quite fidgety. So overall, this child is doing better orally. So he's able to give answers orally much better compared to the written work, which tends to be quite shabby. So going back into his birth history, this child was born full term and it was a cesarean for fetal distress and meconium stain life birth. Had cried immediately after birth, had needed oxygen for a few hours for respiratory distress. And going into family history, father also reported to have had difficulties in match in his childhood. So frequently what we see is that uh, when we go into the history, parents in retrospect remember their school days and they come up with the difficulties that they had faced, which were possibly never diagnosed. And what happens is they tend to navigate around their difficulties and maybe get into a profession or a career which doesn't need maybe those reading skills or those math, those math skills and still land up doing well. But those difficulties were possibly missed out at that time. Now, coming back to this child, when looking at his development, the cross motor milestones were quite fine. They actually didn't remember in detail because the child is now in ninth grade, but nothing concerning too. So they said that, yeah, everything was, everything was on time. But the child had difficulties with what we call as graphomotor skills. So uh, the fine motor use of hands, we call it graphomotor. There are skills, what we call as visual perceptual, where we are you know, looking at the uh, visual spatial skills, visual perceptual, the orientation in space. So here this child specifically had more difficulties with the graphomotor. And also in the daily activities had difficulties with shoelaces, tying shoelaces. So most of the time, the child would prefer to wear Velcro or if even there are shoelaces, they would be open half the time and needing to be reminded to please tie your shoelace. Now this child is also getting into trouble with peers and affecting his you know, friendships. 
So he is getting angry at the slightest provocation, picking up fights. Parents have been called to school a couple of times because he's even got into physical fights. At home is also getting defiant with parents. He is getting argumentative. So a lot of those behavioral concerns are also now coming up. Looking at his academic profile, now looking into history, till the primary years, there were not much concerns noted. So the child was getting about uh, 70, 75% marks, was getting, you know, doing quite okay. But as secondary started, the academic perform performance started declining. So now the child is getting around 35-40% and in the last exam, which really alarmed everyone, he also needed grace marks to pass in his math and geometry and languages. Looking at his reading skills, now this child has managed to learn to read, but is slow at reading, what we call as reading fluency. So he's reading his passage quite slowly and he stops on the long words, on the difficult words, so it is a hesitant reading and frequently seen to skip words. So either he would just not read that word or make up his own words, what we call as word guessing. So frequently what children do is that they would read the first two or three letters of the word and just guess a word that they are familiar with. So for example, house could be read as horse or felt could be read as left. So we do see these kind of errors in reading. The child would also lose track of reading. So has finished reading a line and then completely missed the next line and gone to the next after that. So the child managed to read, complete the passage which was given, but had significant difficulty with understanding what he had read, what we call as comprehension because the reading was so hesitant, was so labored, and there, were, there was misreading of a lot of words in the passage that the child actually couldn't make sense of what he had read. Now, looking at his writing samples, uh, the handwriting was quite poor. A lot of mix of capital and small letters was seen, uh, you know, the punctuations, uh, the speed of writing was slow. And this also reflects into his not being able to complete his exam papers. And even while copying, because one would feel that, okay, you have a word, at least you can copy it, right? But even you see mistakes while copying, either from the board or from somebody else's book. And this child would not prefer to write essays and long answers. So all those long answers would be finished off in very brief, just a few sentences. It's like, Karne ke liye kiya hai. A lot of spelling errors you see in the sample. And the errors are seen not just in English, but also in Hindi and Marathi. So you do see errors with the kanas and the matras. Now, when we look at his math, the speed of calculations is very slow. So the child is still in you know, ninth grade using finger counting to do some of the computations, would tend to miss out steps. And uh, what is more, most difficult is the word problems, what we call as the story sums. So for example, when we say that, okay, I have 15 chocolates and I have to give to five of you, how many should I give to each one of you? And the child is you know, not able to figure out whether I should do addition or subtraction or multiplication or division. So here it is also about figuring out, applying the concepts and also the language involved. So child who has difficulty with language also has difficulty with the word problems. So here, this is the writing sample of the child. Would anyone like to attempt to read it or put it down in the chat box? Uh, what are your observations that you see? So it is it is quite difficult to read through, right? So we are seeing, uh, you know, here to know the principle. See the error that we are seeing here: the P capital P, and it is a very disorganized, shabby kind of writing here. Again, a capital E. So we see a lot of these errors. So in ninth grade, what we expect a child to write. So we expect a certain level of organization in your writing. So when you're given a topic, you would organize your thoughts, you would have an introduction, you would then you know, have your pointers and make paragraphs for it. 
and put your thoughts in a more organized way and then conclude. So here we are seeing a very disorganized writing, the way right from the ideation to putting it down on paper. So, and a lot of shabby writing with lots of cancellations. We are not seeing the punctuations. We are not seeing the paragraphs. So this is the writing that we see in children who have learning disabilities. And look at the math work, similar kind of uh, writing and in the calculations and the work that we are seeing here. So again, looking at the general behavior of this child, the child even in the clinic room is very fidgeted, very impulsive in his responses, uh, gets zones off even while doing the task, starts talking about something else. The parents did mention that he was not able to sit you know, in his seat even when he was younger. And not just his writing, which is disorganized, but he is also quite disorganized in his day-to-day -day activities. So getting ready for school is difficult. So there is always a rush to catch that school bus, planning projects, submitting them on time, overall time management, everything is difficult, which is called as organizational skills or executive functions. And his overall behavior is affecting both his school performance as well as his peer relations and the rapport with his parents. So here, what we are seeing is the child is showing features of a specific learning disability along with ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We are also seeing fine motor difficulties. We are also seeing behavioral concerns. Now let's look at this 11 year old child who is studying in standard four. Now for 11 years standard four, I did ask because it's slightly older age for a standard four and the child did have history of repeating some grades in the younger grades like a first grade and senior kg there was a repeating of a grade now this child is come with the concerns of very poor academic performance and the child has difficulty across all subjects and not only does the child have difficulty with the academic work but even in the non-academic tasks parents say that Overall, the level of understanding seems to be low for age. So a lot of other things, social understanding, behavior, seems immature for age. Even the demeanor, the way you interact, you would find the child to be younger than what the child is. Uh, there is a poor social understanding. And the child also prefers to play with younger children compared to a child of you know his or her age. Now, going back to the history of this child. This child was born full term, but there was fetal distress at the time of labor and needed a vacuum assisted delivery, had not cried immediately after birth and also needed resuscitation and a period of ICU stay for the respiratory distress and the events around the birth. So looking at the development of this child, now this child is uh, going into the milestones, there was history of even the gross motor delays. So the child had started independent walking only after 18 months. The running, coordinated running and jumping also had come in after three years. And even right now, the child has difficulty with balancing on one foot. So activities involving balance and coordination, so not really cycling without the difficulty pedaling, needing the side wheels to cycle, hopping on one leg, all those aspects are still difficult for the child. Has again showing fine motor difficulties and what we call as motor planning. So any activity, you know, even things like, you know, brushing your teeth, the, you, have, you have that activity involves a lot of steps, which is called as motor planning. So the child would still struggle to, you know, even do that simple activity of holding the cap, holding the paste in one hand, putting the uh, paste on the brush. So there was difficulty even with the motor planning. The child had history of speech delay. And even right now, uh, simple instructions is still fine, but the child has difficulty with the two, three and multi-step commands. So it needs the you know, commands to be broken down. Engages in conversations, so the child did talk to me, but the conversations were very brief. The responses were like in one line. 
So was really not able to talk on different topics, was very brief in the conversation. Now this child has also difficulty participating in the other school activities. So whether it is art craft, whether it is sports related activities, the child tends to remain aloof, not really participate actively, has difficulty making friends. And there have been instances where the child has also got bullied by other children. Looking at the academic profile of this child, when we were looking at the reading profile, this child has significant difficulties with reading. So again, the level of difficulty. So this child, even in grade four, was still breaking each word into letters. So was still not able to read the word as a whole. As a result, I mean, the reading itself was so difficult that the child just wouldn't understand what the child is even attempting to read. A lot of spelling mistakes and errors are seen with writing, with copying, is very slow and actually refuses to even write on any topic. So even when we give like a topic, like just write a few lines on myself in grade four, but the child is not even able to attempt to write a few lines on a topic. Very poor math concepts and struggling with a single uh, one digit uh, computation tasks like addition and subtraction. They've started doing time concepts, money concepts in school, uh, but the child has a lot of difficulty reading time in the uh, clock or even understanding the simple money concepts. So here we are seeing difficulties, not just in academics, but also in other non-academic tasks. We are seeing history of delays in other aspects of development. So here we are seeing a child who is showing a profile more like a borderline intellectual uh, functioning or a slow learner. So before we go to the learning disability, let's understand what is the below average intelligence or a borderline intelligence or slow learner profile. So the intelligence is measured as an IQ score and the average IQ is in the range of 90 to 110 and the borderline intelligence or slow learners, the IQ is seen in the range of 71 to 84 and the intellectual disability is less than 70. So in the, in the mainstream school, we do find children who are borderline intelligence and who may be missed. And the child then comes to notice only when the child really starts struggling. And the child goes through a long period of struggle where you know, we have not yet identified the potential of the child that the child is just pressurized to do a lot of tasks which the child inherently finds difficult. In such children, we usually do have a history of even delayed milestones especially when the gross motor milestones. So we really need to look at, so it, when any child comes with any learning issues, we need to look at a lot of uh, other aspects, right from the birth history, development, family history, to come to a conclusion of what it looks like. So now coming to what exactly is specific learning disability and why do we call it specific? So specific learning disability is also called a specific learning disorder. So the, these, these are neurodevelopmental disorders seen in school aged children. And it is, a, it is an invisible disability. So we really can't see it grossly, but it is seen to affect five to 17% of the children across different cultures and different countries. And males uh, are seen to you know, have it more than females. And they have been seen to have a significant academic as well as psychosocial impacts on the child and on the adolescent and even going into adulthood. So how do we define or describe or diagnose specific learning disability? So this is as per the DSM-5 criteria. DSM stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. So these criteria were revised in 2013 to DSM-5. Till then, we were using the DSM-4 criteria. So here we see difficulties. Any child who is showing a difficulty in at least one of the following areas, uh, as per the DSM-5, if the difficulties have lasted at least for six months despite targeted intervention. So despite having given adequate help to the child, if the child still continues to show these difficulties. So what could be the difficulty? It could be difficulty with reading. So it could be with 
accuracy, word reading accuracy. So as we saw the example of was and saw or felt and left, or it could be a very slow, effortful reading. So the child is managing to read, but the fluency is slow. Now the child manages to read, but finds it difficult to understand the meaning of what is read, what we call as reading comprehension. There could be difficulty with spellings and also with written expression. So putting your thoughts down. So one is oral expression, but written expression is what you're you know, writing on paper. So it could be grammar, punctuation, or the organization of what we saw in that writing paper, uh, in the uh, writing sample. There could be difficulty understanding the number concepts or calculations or with mathematical reasoning or what we call as applied math. So uh, when, we, when we talked of the word problems or applying your mathematical concepts, so if the child could be having difficulty across any of these areas, which have to be proven by a standardized testing. So when you when you see a markedly below age level performance on standardized testing, which is at least 1.5 standard deviations below what is expected for the age. Now this child is having a normal IQ. So it is again, not due to any other conditions like an intellectual disability. So children with learning disability, in fact, have average to many children even have above average IQ, but they still have a lot of difficulty in, in any of these areas of academics. And that's the reason why it is called as specific. So in spite of having a good IQ, the child is still not able to perform and still not able to get the kind of marks which his other friends are getting. And it is again not due to any other sensory impairments like a visual or hearing impairment. That's the reason why we need to do those tests also before we do any testing. It is also not due to any other psychosocial adverse events. And it is also not due to lack of educational instruction or lack of opportunity for education. So a child who has not got an opportunity to go to school and is not doing well, we cannot label the child as having a learning disability. So as per DSM-4, the reading disability was called dyslexia. The writing uh, difficulty was called as dysgraphia and the math difficulty was called as dyscalculia. But now with the DSM-5, specific learning disability is one umbrella term with specifiers. So it is SLD with impairment in reading or with impairment in written expression or with impairment in mathematics. So why do we see children with learning disability? What are the causes? So there are genetic causes, there are environmental causes and a combination. So what we call as gene environment interplay and it has a neurobiological basis. So the areas of the brain that govern the reading, understanding, speaking, written expression are affected. It is more so to the uh, connectivity, the neuronal connectivity and the circuits which are involved. And it is often seen to run in families. And there are also other risk factors, which could be antenatal or events related to birth or postnatal events, which can contribute to this disability. So uh, let's look at the major brain areas and the interconnectivity, which is involved in the process of reading. So here we have the visual cortex when we're reading, then we look at the visual form, uh, word form area, then there is a phonological processing which uh, happens there, the semantic verbal working memory and the semantic, the semantic is understanding meaning of the words. And then we go into the Broca's area. So this, this is the connectivity of the circuit involved with the process of reading. So let's look at what happens in typical readers uh, versus the readers with dyslexia. So, there have been many functional brain imaging studies which have been done. And these studies have shown an inefficient uh, functioning of the posterior brain systems of the left hemisphere, which has been called like a neural signature of dyslexia. And what Shevitz have has found using the uh, functional MRI studies that in typical readers, generally there is a greater activation in the posterior reading systems 
compared to the readers with dyslexia where we are not seeing that activation. So what happens is that readers with, with dyslexia, they compensate by developing anterior systems bilaterally to compensate for the lack of the activation in the posterior systems, which can enable the reading, but it does not still support the fluent or the rapid reading and the comprehension. So how early can we pick up learning disabilities? So learning disability can be diagnosed after seven or eight years of age when we are actually doing the psychoeducational testing, which we have said as one of the criteria in the diagnosis. But we can pick the signs of learning disability much earlier. We can pick them even at three and four years of age. And what are the signs that we pick up and what we call is these children are at risk for learning disability. So these can be picked up in the, even in the preschool years. So what we see here is most parents, a lot of parents would say that the, their child talked later than most other children. So we do see a history of language delays and also pronunciation difficulty. So what we call as articulation. So uh, there would be difficulties with articulation, slow vocabulary growth. So adding the word count to the vocabulary. So often the child finds it difficult to find that right word. The child is, you know, while speaking also hesitating to get that right word to speak. A lot of activities which are done during the preschool year, years, like the rhyming word activities, learning the numbers, letters, days of the week, color, shapes, it gets difficult for the child to learn and understand and recall these concepts. Children do have difficulty understanding connections between letters and sounds, what we call as phonics. As a child goes into the early primary school years, you start seeing some of the difficulties with the reading and spelling. So we could see reversals like V and D or inversions like M and W or jumbling the sequences in the words felt and left or misreading the words, word guessing, house and home. You also see reversals with the numbers and confusion with the signs that we saw in the child that we had seen in the case, first case. We could also see early signs related to some of the comorbidities which are associated, associated with learning disability. So we could maybe see the sign of the ADHD first. So we could see an extremely restless or distracted child in a preschool. Uh, we may not actually be able to see what the child is doing with letters and numbers, but it is just an indicator that yes, the child could be hyperactive, the child could be having also learning disability. We also see fine motor skills, which are slow to develop. So it could be like an unstable pencil grip or you know the other fine motor activities like buttoning, unbuttoning, use of scissors, coloring within the lines, beads. These all could be difficult for the child. We do also see poor coordination, a child who tends to be clumsy, not aware of the physical surroundings and again prone to injuries and accidents. So when we see these aspects in the child, it should ring alarm bells that, am I looking at any aspect of learning disability? Let me look into more detail of what else is a child able to do and not able to do and follow up. So there are also signs that we see in an older school going child. So now when the child is in higher primary and or in the secondary grades, what do we see? So this child has cracked the code of reading, but the child is still having difficulty reading fluently. So the speed of reading, the reading fluency is slow. Again, trouble with comprehension, summarizing. So when the child is reading a passage and you ask, okay, tell me, what did you understand from this? The child is not able to, uh, you know, put it into words or summarize because the child has difficulty, have, difficulty having comprehended it. You frequently see the same word spelled differently, even in a single piece of writing. So one would wonder that at one place it's fine, that other place it's wrong, at the other place it's completely wrong and it's very differently wrong. So you see different spellings of the same word you know, spelled differently. Again, difficulty with essays and long answers and word problems. And the child also has trouble with what we call like abstract concepts. So open-ended questions. What do you think uh, this, why do you think that this happened? 
or uh, questions needing inferential thinking, conclusive thinking, making your own conclusions are difficult for the child. The child frequently misreads or misinterprets information. So it could be misinterpreting a question or misinterpreting what he's reading and also recall what we call as retrieval from short term as well as long, long term memory. So the second child whom we saw where the mom said that was blank in the exam and a kalhi sub lesson liya and exam is sub bhul gaya. So this happens frequently where the memory is affected, the child is not able to recall what the child has read and memorized. And also we may just see a child who has difficulty making friends, getting into trouble with friends. And the child could be having difficulty either due to the primary learning issues or it could be due to the other comorbidities that might be there along with the learning issues like the attention issues or the behavioral concerns. So what do we do? Is intervention useful? Yes, yes, and yes. Intervention is very useful and early intervention is the key. So research has shown that if we detect the learning disabilities or even the sign of learning disabilities early, and if it is remediated, uh, we can see improvements with the reading, written expressions, and the math skills. So what is remediation? Remediation, or what is also called as remedial therapy or special education therapy, is a structured way of teaching, which is done by the special educators, where you know, they go step by step in a, in a structure, the process of the decoding of the words, breaking it down into phonics, coding it back, blending. So the whole process of reading, which is difficult for the child, is, is broken down and taught in a more systematic way. And it is, it is a different way of teaching compared to the regular classroom instruction. So what we say that the child says, if I cannot learn the way you teach, will you teach me the way I learn? So that is what we need to do. So what is important is that we need to identify the challenges with the learning early and intervene early. And we should not wait for the child to fail. So what is called as the wait to fail model is not something uh, which we should look at. We have to pick up the struggle early, uh, a struggling child early and give him the help before the child starts to fail. So what we call as starting early interventions and then looking at response to the interventions. So here we do also have research evidence of the effect of early intervention and remediation in the child. So uh, children with no remediation. So here we are seeing a normal reading children with the rhyming and the dyslexic children before remediation. And we find that with the functional MRI studies, the areas which were not activated before, after a year of remediation, start showing the activation. So we also have research-based evidence that early remediation, early identification and remediation helps. So learning disability also comes with its own bag of comorbidities or uh, conditions which are seen along with the learning disabilities or sometimes as a result of the learning disability. So we see ADHD quite often with the learning disability. So it is seen, various studies have shown ADHD in the range of 10 to 60%. There are also other oppositional defined behaviors, conduct disorders, emotional problems like anxiety, depression, which could be along or as a result of the learning disabilities, autism spectrum disorder, and as we saw, developmental coordination disorders. So it is very important to also identify all these comorbidities and manage. So let's look at one of the very common comorbidity that we see along with learning disability. So what is ADHD or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder? It is again, one of the most common neurodevelopmental disorders of childhood. And here we see developmentally inappropriate degrees of inattention with or without hyperactivity impulsivity. So see, whenever we see attention levels in children or the activity levels in children, it is all on a continuum. So there are some children who are naturally sitting very quietly there are some children who are quite overactive or quite active. When do we call it hyperactivity? When it crosses a certain threshold and it looks developmentally inappropriate for the, you know, the age and weight of the child. 
So there are different criteria again here to diagnose ADHD. And it runs a chronic course, it affects children, but it can also continue into adulthood and adults. And these affect not just the social and academic performance, but even in you know, adolescents and adults, it can also affect the occupational functioning. So it is very important to identify and uh, you know, uh, intervene early enough. And again, just like learning disability, it also is quite common and seen in 7.2% 7 7 amongst children. So what are the different criteria for ADHD? So again, here we have the SM5 criteria and there are features related to attention issues, features related to hyperactivity and impulsivity. So here we have a child who has difficulty paying attention to details, making careless mistakes, also sustaining attention through tasks which involve sustained mental effort. So when, when the child is in the older grades and you need tasks where you have to you know, pay attention for 20, 25 minutes, 30 minutes at a stretch. So the child does have difficulty in sustaining the attention. Often you feel that I'm falling out and the child is just not listening to me. Following through with instructions, following multi-step commands also may be difficult. The child could just present with more of organizational difficulties. What we saw in the in the second child where, you know, organization with daily activities, what we call as executive functions. And the child is, you know, often distracted and would be could lose things frequently and is forgetful in daily activities. So these are all different things that we see related to attention. There could be problems with hyperactivity or impulse control. So child could be quite fidgety, not able to remain seated, not able to play even the quiet play activity. So we see difficulties with attention hyperactivity, not just in academic tasks, but even in non-academic tasks. So even quiet play activity, sitting and playing, you know, a board game or playing chess could still be difficult. The child could still be wanting to get that. So the child seems often on the go as if, you know, driven by a motor, a child who's talking excessively or interrupting conversations, not waiting for his turn. Uh, these are all the aspects. A child who is not able to wait on in the class to answer a question. So just blurts out an answer even before the question is completed and sometimes giving even the wrong answer because the child has not yet heard the question completely. So ADHD is also diagnosed, has diagnostic criteria. So the if we see at least six or more symptoms in children where uh, or from the attention uh, list or the hyperactivity list, so it could be diagnosed as predominantly inattention presentation or a combined where we see six or more in both or a predominant hyperactive presentation. And in older adolescents above 17 years and in adults also who get diagnosed with ADHD, we see at least five or more. Symptoms should have persisted for six months and generally present since childhood, less than 12 years of age. So here again, what are the risk factors or causes? Uh, similar factors we see like learning disability, genetic factors, environmental factors, and we do frequently see ADHD also running in families. And what we also see that the symptom manifestation also changes as the child grows. So you wouldn't find ADHD looking just the same in a three, four, three-year-old compared to what we see in a 13-year-old. Uh, Again, ADHD is not really diagnosed by uh, until five or six, but we would call it more like at risk for ADHD. But what we see in a preschooler, a preschooler child would be quite hyperactive, you know, all over the place, not sitting in one place, not having any sense of sense of danger. In the primary school, a child would look just more distracted, forgetful, again, not really remaining seated in one place. And you know difficulty with you know all the other uh, difficulty with the other organization skills. But what we see in adolescents is you know the hyperactivity typically tends to settle down. So we don't see a child in eighth or ninth grade running around like a child that we see in a preschool. A child would be seated, but the child does still tend to remain 
fidgety, squirmy, doing something with hands and you know feet. Also, adults, uh, older adolescents and adults, they they share a kind of an inner restlessness that they feel. So they may not be overtly hyperactivity, but they also tend to feel restless. And we see a lot of executive and organizational difficulties in the uh, adolescent or the adult. So how do we manage learning disability as well as ADHD? Right? So management includes many aspects in a child. And as we see that there are, you know, they could be seen together and we have to have a very holistic approach to the management. We cannot look at it individually. So when we look at a younger child, we're looking at early markers, starting the interventions early. We would do the psychoeducational evaluation at the right age. And again, many factors need to be looked at before we send a child in for an evaluation because if the child has ADHD, the attention issues need to be treated first before the child goes for the psychoeducational evaluation because the child needs to be able to focus during the IQ and the educational testing. So we need to look at a lot of those aspects. A child may also need other assessments and interventions by the occupational therapist to look at the fine motor, attention, the visual perceptual, visual spatial skills. We need to look at all the comorbidities with ADHD and other aspects with anxiety, depression. So we need a lot of interventions, remediations, and even behavioral management. And some children with ADHD as well as other uh, issues, psychiatric issues may also need to be put on medications. The child would also benefit and uh, need a lot of accommodations and modifications. So what do we mean by accommodations? So uh, children who are diagnosed with learning disabilities or even who are seen at risk for learning disabilities can be given accommodations at the school level and the government has also uh, provided accommodations even in the board exam level. So which includes giving extra time to the child to complete the papers, also giving writers to write, especially a child who has dysgraphia. The examiner could read out the papers, the child could use calculators for math or use modifications like you, uh, you know, using a lower level math. So instead of the 10th grade math, at the SSC exam, they can take a seventh grade math or even exempt uh, or drop off some languages. So there are many accommodations and modifications which you know the child can avail of. We need to educate the parents because parental education is the most important is a starting point. Many times the children are reprimanded, the children are called lazy. It begins at the family level. There is sibling comparison. We all have seen the movie Tare Zameen Kare. We have seen what happens, and this does happen in many families. Of course, there are some families who are supportive, but we need to look at uh, you know, how much does the parent know about this condition. So, one is you have to make the parent understand this condition and support the child, not just at home, but even through the you know, education, his journey of learning and his journey of schooling. Also, the parents should be made aware of the rights of the child. So the process of certification. So, you know, the one is the evaluation and also the certification, so it, especially which is you know, done in the government uh, institutes. So here, when the child is certified to have learning disabilities, a child can get lots of accommodations at the board level and even further going on, has reservations even for college admissions and university admissions. So we need to make the parent aware of you know, all those aspects related to the rights of the child. It is very important to also have a supportive schooling environment. Uh, the school should be giving the accommodations, not just wait for the 10th grade, but right through the schooling years. So the teachers should be you know, primed to first pick up the signs. So typically, if a child can get screened in the third grade to pick up signs of learning disability, that would be very beneficial for the later development of the child. So supportive schooling and parenting is also very important. So to just sum it up, just the pointers, very important to identify the at-risk child for learning disability. If we can pick up in the, you know, at the age three, four, nothing like it, we really need to do that. Start early interventions. 
it is important to look for and manage all the comorbidities. So a holistic approach, a multidisciplinary management. And we all who are working with children, in whichever specialities we may be, we need to be advocate of the child and support the child throughout his journey towards adulthood and so that the child is able to you know, achieve the maximum potential. What is most important is to identify the strengths of the child because most of the times we are all saying the child cannot do this, the child got so many marks, the child failed this exam. But what is important to important is to see what is a child good at. The child could have special talents, the child could have special interests, which can help build confidence and self-esteem in the child. And some of it could also be some, you know, uh, aspects where the child could then develop further for the future profession and careers. So we need to look at all these aspects to manage the child with learning disability as well as ADHD and all the other comorbid conditions which come along with it. So this is related to the specific LD and the ADHD. And I would also like to talk uh, in brief about the autism spectrum disorders. Since April is the Autism Awareness Month, and while we are meeting on this platform, I would like to say a few, share a few slides related to this condition. So again, autism disorders uh, are developmental conditions like the learning issues as well as attention issues. So they are present in the child since birth. And here we see predominant challenges uh, for the child related to social communication as well as interactions. And we do see a pattern of behavior which looks repetitive and the child may have other sensory concerns. So let me elaborate on all these aspects. Uh, but before that, let's look at how big is the problem. So the current statistics, the CDC, Center of Disease Control Statistics, is showing a prevalence of one in 36 children. And the worldwide estimated prevalence is about one in 100. So we are looking at 1% worldwide prevalence. So it is also a condition which really needs to be identified early because just like other developmental conditions, we are looking at early identification and early intervention. So how early can you see the signs of autism? Autism signs can be seen even in the first one or two years of life. So what do we see? Uh, even in the first six months, uh, parents frequently say that the child is you know, not really engaging in that interactive to and fro at six months when the child engages into to and fro babbling, uh, making sounds, giving responses. So even at three months and six months, we can pick up those very, very early signs. But typically what parents come with is, you know, the child is not responding when we are calling by name, but the child immediately looks when the mobile starts or when the favorite Coco Melon rhyme comes on the mobile. The child is not giving an eye contact. There are language delays that we see, but the child is also not compensating for the language delays by using appropriate non-verbal communication or you know, gestures like pointing out to things. So not only is a child able to speak out, he please give water, but the child is also not able to point at the water bottle. The child just drags to the water bottle or just places the bottle in your hand. So use of appropriate gestures and nonverbal communication and pointing is not just for wanting something, but also for sharing things. So when we go out, you know, children start sharing things. Mama, look at the doggy. You don't want the doggy, but you're just sharing because you got very excited looking at the doggy. But the child would not share or you know, show the excitement. And also, likewise, not respond to our pointing when we are showing something to the child, what is called as joint attention. Along with this, we also see repetitive patterns, which could be motor stereotypies that the child is showing some repetitive patterns like spinning or running in the room back and forth from one end to the other or flapping hands, or it could be repetitive patterns in the play. So just lining up objects or even with the speech. So just saying letters and numbers. So some children, some parents say that 
बहुत एकेडमिक उसको आता है सेम जितना एबीसीडी पूरा बोलता है सब नंबर फिफ्टी तक आता है इवन अ टू ईयर ओल्ड सब कलर्स आता है बट द पेरेंट फेल्स टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट द चाइल्ड इज नॉट एंगेजिंग इन कॉन्वर्जेशन द चाइल्ड इज जस्ट शोइंग यू नो सेइंग एकेडमिक नंबर्स राइम्स बट नॉट रियली सेइंग गिव मी व्हाट टॉक सो दीस आर द एस्पेक्ट्स दैट वी नीड टू लुक एट एट एन अर्ली एज the child also show sensitivities to the environment so could be you know sensitive to the sounds or may not like certain textures like touching sand grass or even the messy activities slime activities that they do in preschool the child does not prefer touching wet food with with his or her own hand so there are a spectrum of difficulties that we see and it is called a spectrum disorder because every child is different so no two children will show all the things and every child's challenges needs and even the level of support needed is different so there is a wide variation in the severity of symptoms and there is also wide variation in the level of language development and also in the level of cognitive development so there would be some children who are also cognitively low functioning but there are also some children who are average to even above average or superior genius iq so it is a very very wide spectrum so generally autism is diagnosed by 2 years or so sometimes in a younger child one if the child is showing all the features and all the criteria can be also diagnosed earlier and in some children we may even wait especially the high functioning children where you know all the aspects may not show up all the social challenges may not show up and we may we may even wait to make a diagnosis and diagnosis is purely behavioral looking at the behaviors and the development of the child and there is no medical test no blood test no ct scans or mris to make the diagnosis of autism so again autism is caused by a combination of genetic and environmental factors and vaccines do not cause autism so there is no link research has proven that and it can be a lifelong condition there is no medical cure but again your early identification and early intervention can really improve the quality of life can develop the communication interaction and help with the behavior patterns so these words are keywords awareness about the condition so if we are aware even whichever field we are practicing in but if we are aware of these signs that we can see for whatever the child may have come to you for giving the early support to the child early interventions very important to have an inclusive environment not just inclusive in the family parents need to be inclusive society needs to be inclusive school needs to be inclusive we need to have equal opportunities or at least opportunities as per the skill of the child so all these are very very important to develop uh, uh, the to the maximum potential of the child so i would like to end my talk here with whatever developmental condition we are looking at we really need to identify it early give the early intervention and also have a very supportive environment to the child uh i'd like to take any questions if anybody has any questions uh hi dr priyanka thank you for that excellent talk um i think the the heading was very apt that you know we are all i think there's a lot you've created a lot of awareness and sensitized us to these uh, behavioral and learning problems um you know i was well i was listening to your talk i was remembering my time in school you know um the child would have failed a class um what would have been done is uh, you know parents now will just send the child to more tuitions uh, yeah. the child self esteem has taken a beating uh parents are upset and unhappy or even the child who's like considered very talkative and naughty being made to stand outside class all the time parents being called now all these children might have a lot of them might have just been a learning disability or adhd or some behavioral issue right yes and yes. i think yeah so had they been helped and gotten the necessary accommodations i think they would have been very different uh, leading very different lives today um so i think early identification and getting them help is just very key to um, key for the child 
Yes, yes. So these conditions really don't have any medicines that we can give. So many parents say, "Kya koi medicine de do?" But you know, of course, medicines right. have a role, but they have a limited role. But right. uh, there are a lot of interventions, uh, a lot of you know support that we really need to give the child. And what what is also important is the awareness and making them understand the challenges and helping you know develop the potential of the child. It's it's most important. Absolutely, like a lot of these children come on brain tonics, and uh, yes. you know testing has not been done, and uh, uh, yeah, they're just going around in circles. I think testing and getting the problem identified is super important. Um, questions: uh, We have one question. Uh, is there a screening questionnaire for picking up children with specific learning disability in the early school years? Yeah, so see, uh, the government has come up with you know some of the. screening questionnaires which can be used by uh, school children uh, but even if we use uh, by school teachers but even if we use even these uh, you know screening questions which are uh, you know from uh, websites like you know the learning disability online where, where you have different even more questions for the preschool age for the school going age and even for the secondary uh, school age it can you know help identify uh, children with learning disability um dr priyanka can you tell us till what age uh, the letter reversals you know b for a d um, or simple like basic math errors are considered normal development like just considered normal yes so see we do see uh, as a part of the normal development we do see reversals initially when the child is learning to read when 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 we are at the letter recognition stage so we do see it till you know 4 5 years of age uh, at times but when it is persisting beyond 6 and 7 years of age uh, or even you know around 8 years like how what we when we saw in that child who was in third grade that is a time we have to really look more into the details because okay. those they, those okay. things should wane off so uh, once okay. once we see them at a younger age they should start reducing but if we see persistence of those kind of errors uh, we it should ring an alarm bell okay thank you uh, do we have any other questions oh uh, yes does anybody have a question um i think no more no more questions no more questions i think yeah. so should i stop the screen share yes yes thank you so much dr priyanka thank you for the excellent talk uh and thank you to all the speakers and the attendees for attending today's master class and uh hope to see everybody at the next master class session uh thank you and have a good evening thank you dr parekh thank you pooja and thank you to all the organizers and all the other speakers for the excellent talk there was a lot of learning even from the other talks absolutely yes and thank you to all the participants for your patient hearing okay. all right thank you Oh, oh, oh. 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 Oh, oh, oh.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 